Welcome to 15 Minutes on the Way, Season 6, The Good, the Bad, and the Foolish. If you're a first-time listener, you really owe it to yourself to start at the beginning. You can easily find Episode 1 of Season 1 at 15minutesontheway.com. Don't spell out the number. Otherwise, brace yourself for a conversation with God's voice telling his side of your story. It's a very realistic hope and expectation on the part of the people of Israel that with the passing of Solomon, his endless expansion and building projects would die with him. It's perfectly reasonable for them to think that now that I have fulfilled my promises and brought the land's borders to their pledged limits, now that there are fortifications along those borders and ample materials with which to supply them, and, most importantly, now that the glory of Israel and I, her God, have been established for all the world to see, with my spanking new spectacular temple right in my people's midst, life can move out of the Solomon the Builder, can we build it, yes we can phase, into the far more pleasant and sustainable let's get back to our normal lives stage. That request is formally made of the new king immediately upon his coronation up at Shechem the request that the laborers be relieved of their duties. But before we get Rehoboam on the throne, it's important to add another layer, the layer of geography, to the coronation cake awaiting him. We noted some political savvy a couple generations ago on the part of Solomon's dad, David, in his choosing a neutral town unclaimed by any of the twelve tribes to become the capital city for the nation. Jebus was right on the border between lands claimed by David's tribe Judah and their neighbor to their immediate north, Benjamin. David claimed Jebus evicted the Jebusites, and made it Jerusalem. The thing is, Jebus may have been unclaimed and thus showed no tribal favoritism, but it was definitely a city of the south. These two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, represent the two southernmost tribes in the nation. They also represent the only tribes from which Israel's short list of kings have come. Saul was a Benjamite, and the house of David is all Judah from start to finish, which obviously includes Solomon and David's grandson, Rehoboam. The kings all coming in a direct line from David doesn't seem like that big a deal at this point, but it's about to be. We've already seen some significant north-south tension between these two tribes and the northern ten along the way and those tensions have been increased these past few years as Solomon has leaned more heavily on the northern ten to provide labor for all his projects. There are some other factors at play as well, but these are the big ones. There's a growing feeling in the north, for good reason, that they're not being cared for by the southern establishment, yet being called on to do more than their fair share of the work. Political thinking obviously runs in the family. David set Jebus, Jerusalem, as his neutral capital. Solomon married all those princesses from neighboring nations. We are so not saying this is a good thing, just using it as an example of Solomon's politics. Oh, that he'd have left his bedroom politics alone and let me keep the peace with his neighbors. But we digress. Thinking politically like his forebears, Rehoboam chooses the town of Shechem to host his coronation. 1 Kings 12 narrates the coronation sequence with a parallel in 2 Chronicles 10. Shechem is a charged place further north in the territory of Manasseh. The tribe of his brother Ephraim is right next door and lies between Manasseh and Benjamin. So Shechem's not that much further north but it's definitely a northern city. 
call it the difference between Philadelphia and Richmond. Another thing Shechem has going for it, in terms of Rehoboam's desire to play politics with the North, is that in addition to geographic political association, it has a strong historic resonance for the nation. In case it slipped your memory, once Joshua battled his way north well into the promised land, he chose Shechem to be the spot where he renewed the covenant with us and charged the people to put away foreign gods and incline their hearts to me. That's Joshua 24, establishing the potential for the poignant irony to come. At the time, Joshua was thinking of my interaction with Abram at Shechem back in the early days of the Abra plan, meeting with him under the old oak tree there and saying, This right here is the land I'm going to give you, Abram. That's way back in Genesis 12, 6. Joshua obviously had a mind for symbolic geography too. Shechem is also where the bones of Joseph are finally laid to rest in a symbolic we have arrived in the promised land moment. So, of course, the tribe of Joseph's oldest boy, Manasseh, occupies the land in which their exponentially great granddaddy is buried. All in all, Shechem has a lot going for it and really is a crackerjack place to kick off a new monarchy in a move to try to make all the people from south and north feel like they're part of the picture and part of the long-term story. And so, with those layers now on your radar, Jeroboam, a fellow from Ephraim, one of those two Joseph tribes we just mentioned, Jeroboam finally takes the cause of the northern workers before the new king, Rehoboam. Jeroboam is well acquainted with the situation, having been a laborer himself. A bit like his forebear, Joseph, Jeroboam had so impressed Solomon with his initiative and diligence that the king made Jeroboam a supervisor over all the conscripted laborers from the double tribe of Joseph. Again, that's Manasseh and Ephraim, if that hasn't stuck yet. Don't worry, it's fine if it hasn't. This will not be on the final exam. Jeroboam is thus the perfect person to advocate for the workers of the north. Call him the union rep. Jeroboam approaches the new king in front of the entire assembly and says, your father has had us breaking our backs building all his projects these many years. Life has been hard for us, but the work is finished. If you lighten the load on us and give us a break, we'll give you our full support and be happy to serve you. I think we have made perfectly clear that we consider this to be an extremely reasonable request. It seems that Rehoboam wants to do the right thing, and, like his dad before him, is well aware that he's a rookie. He tells Jeroboam that he needs three days to figure out what to do. Then he gets some advice. To his credit, he starts with his dad's cabinet of older gents that are headed into retirement. In their experience and wisdom, they recognize the truth of Jeroboam's statement and request and recommend that Rehoboam grant it. They encourage Rehoboam to relent and dismiss the northern tribes from labor, for they agree that the people will then feel blessed by their king and be his loyal servants all his days. And boy, would the rest of this story and of the entire owner's manual, for that matter, be a whole lot different if Rehoboam had done exactly that. He doesn't. Regrettably, Rehoboam also processes his options with the buddies he's grown up with. They are far younger, far less experienced, and all ego. They're still quite juvenile in their belief that being a man is all about pride, strength, and control to the exclusion of all else. To their shame, their advice to Rehoboam is that he can't let this lightweight nobody Jeroboam tell him how to run his kingdom. 
that instead of having mercy on these laborers who have fashioned such a marvelous kingdom at the hands of Solomon, Rehoboam should tell them that his father's projects were just the beginning, that they don't yet know what hard work really is, but they're about to find out. So, adolescent is their thinking, that these guys actually recommend that Rehoboam begin his official response with the claim that his little finger is thicker than Solomon's legendary loins. Really? Really? You think I'm kidding? I wish I was, but it's right there in the manual, 1 Kings 12.10. Though delicately translated waste in the NIV, more precisely as loins, a generalized euphemism in and of itself, in the NRSV and others. Since I know many of you will now look the passage up to see for yourselves, let's end there today and promise that the great saga that is now beginning will not stop my plan from moving forward to rescue you and the rest of the human race. Thanks for listening. We hope this episode has been a blessing to you. If you'd like to support what we do, give us a review on iTunes or Facebook, then share this podcast with your friends. There's a link to the very first episode right under today's podcast on our website, 15minutesontheway.com. We hope today's podcast has reminded you that you, friend, are part of an epic story that is still unfolding today. So keep walking on the way. And until next time, be good to yourself.